Now, from the Signature Bank Studios. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. So uh, the expected damage control for Kamala after the interview she gave to Brett Baer. This is how Politico told the story. Harris praised her interlocutor, Brett Baer, as a serious journalist. A contrast from Trump saying Fox News was owned by her spokesman, uh, Ian Sams. And she took a she took a step to diffuse last week's cell phone that her presidency would not be much different than Joe Biden's. My presidency would not be a continuation of Joe Biden's presidency, she told Bear. Oh, didn't didn't explain how. Parenthetically, Harris survived the interview with no apparent gaffes going on offense on a day Trump seemed mired in a defensive crouch. Oh my God. And then they were touting that they got seven point one million views where his town hall earlier in the day with a. Uh, Harris Faulkner only got three million views. But if it was such a successful interview, why didn't they put any of the clips on her campaign website or on Twitter or X or Facebook? Why not publish, you know, let everybody who couldn't see it at the time, you know, check out your great work, the great interview that you did. Yeah, a lot of disasters get more clicks on YouTube than do uh, uh, you know, world-class performances, too. So I don't, I don't know that necessarily views is the metric by which you uh, properly assess impact. Um, Hillary Clinton was uh, trotted out, part of the sisterhood of the traveling pantsuit with Kamala, trotted out on Larry O'Donnell's show to uh, run interference. And then on Fox, she stood up for herself. She didn't take any of the sort of foxiness uh, mm-hmm. rhetoric that came from uh, Bear, and she was able to make her points despite every effort to undermine her and talk over her. She's exactly the kind of person that I want to be president. No, there's no question. Yeah, it was uh, it was great that she was able to try to drown Brett Bear's questioning out because. Of course, the point of the interview is to just sit there and say, go and let her talk uninterrupted for 26 minutes. Sure. OK. Well, you know, thinking of Hillary, though, it reminded me of something. It reminded me of Hillary's response to Benghazi. And that reminded me of Kamala's response to the uh, Alexis Nungary, mom of 12 year old Jocelyn, who was murdered by a con- uh, person in this country illegally. This is where she got it. Hillary sort of provided the template. Mm -hmm. Remember what Hillary's uh, posture was towards Benghazi? You know, as secretary of state, I take responsibility. I take general responsibility so I don't have to offer a, a specific accounting. And this is what you got from Kamala in what I thought was the most devastating moment of the interview. Where Brett. Uh, played that clip of Jocelyn and Gary's mom and asked her to react. Madam Vice President, it was a policy decision in the early part of your administration. I will let one of the mothers talk about it. Take a listen. Because of the Biden-Harris administration open border policies catch and release, they were enrolled in the Alternatives to Detention program. This meant that they were released into the United States. It was not even a full three weeks later that they would take my daughter, Jocelyn Nungare's life. I believe the Biden-Harris administration open border policies are responsible for the death of my daughter. That's the early days. So do you owe them an apology is what I I'm saying. I will tell you that I am so sorry for her loss. I am so sorry for her loss. Sincerely. But let's talk about what is happening right now with an individual who does not want to participate in solutions. Let's talk about that as well. But do you want to answer that? In all fairness, I told you, I feel awful for what she and her family have experienced. Mm. Uh, And we're supposed to feel awful that Kamala feels awful. The expression of apology without the acceptance of responsibility. And yet she was in the room for all the major decisions. She uh, and major major decisions Joe Biden made exceedingly well, according to her. Why didn't you just say that in the Biden administration, which, yes, I was a part of. We did make mistakes. We made bad decisions. But I, I, that will not happen again. I'm taking ownership of this. But she can't do that. No, no. 
That's no. not how you do it. Oh, you do okay, it like sorry. Hill Dog did with Benghazi. Yeah, that's right. Dave what Seminar's, difference does it make? Dave Seminar is a former diplomat, author of Footsteps of Federer, and Mad Travelers, A Tale of Wanderlust, Greed, and the Quest to Reach the Ends of the Earth. Dave, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, before we get to uh, Kamala and the campaign, uh, mm-hmm. how did yeah. you fare? I, 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 I saw you wrote about it a bit, so I have an idea. But yeah. how did you, how did you fare in St. Petersburg, Florida, with uh, Milton and Helene? We were lucky on both occasions compared to you know many of our neighbors. Literally, you know, my next door neighbor, uh, his house flooded very badly. I think the statistic I saw was for Pinellas County, where I live, something like seventeen thousand homes flooded, either during Milton or Helene. We had two within 12 days, and um, I came out of it uh, pretty well, although we have all these big, huge oak trees, which were kind of massacred. So my entire driveway, I should say half of my driveway, is filled with uh, lumber right now. I could have a huge bonfire, or I could wait for months for them to pick up this debris. I don't know. We'll see what, we'll see what we decide to do. I don't know. You don't, you don't have the serve pro, serve pro trucks uh, circling the neighborhood getting stuff cleaned up? No, because what's happening is the dump sites, it's a three, four hour wait to actually dump a load of debris. Right. So no one actually wants to do that. <laughs> There's plenty of opportunists around who are willing to trim your trees, chop things. They're willing to do all kinds of work, but they don't want to go to the dump site because it takes three, four hours to dump a load. Um, in our FEMA site, you know, uh, you, you might have heard our, our mayor, our, our illustrious mayor, had a telephone call with uh, Kamala Harris. Did you hear about that? After DeSantis didn't take her call. She turned to the mayor of St. Petersburg, our woke mayor, Ken Welch, who was really completely incompetent. They had a telephone call that both of them uh, tweeted out a video of, and she boasted that we, they were, they were going to open up this FEMA office for us, a disaster office here in St. Petersburg. That's what Kamala said. Well, I, I went to go check that out on Monday, and it turns out that place, our disaster recovery center, is a disaster in and of itself. First of all, it's not in St. Petersburg, as Kamala said it was going to be. It's in a town called Largo, which is about 30, 40 minutes away from us. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went there on uh, Tuesday, I'm sorry, I think it was Tuesday around lunchtime, and there must have been five, 600 people in line, and I would estimate the FEMA employees there. There were maybe, I would say, five or six employees there. So the customer-to-employee ratio was about 100 to 1. People were standing for hours in the broiling sun trying to get questions answered. Uh, they had already run out of meals. They were supposed to be giving out free meals there. They had already run out of – I was there I think around 1 o'clock. They would already run out of food. That's how many people who had come by. So, yeah, not too impressed. Mm. You'd have to waste the whole day. You'd have to take off work just to try and get some FEMA relief. Do you know anybody who's gotten anything, any benefits yes. at all from FEMA? Yes. Yes. In fact, the FEMA money has already uh, come through, and if you lost power – if you lost, sorry, my dog is crying over here. Okay. We, uh, if you lost power for a certain number of days and were out of, you know, there's a certain number of different criteria. My wife filled out the application, and the FEMA money, I believe, we got seven hundred dollars. It came direct deposited into our account, literally in like two days after the after we filed the application. So that I was actually impressed by. Now, if only we could get our city cleaned up, you know, after Helene, you know, so many people lost everything. So it was outside, like literally, it's so sad coming around the city because you see people's entire belongings, everything, their flooring, their furniture, every, and all of these belongings uh, were not picked up after Helene, right? So they had 11 or 12 days in between the hurricanes to try to, you know, remove all this stuff, and they did not do so. So a lot of contaminated stuff is everywhere. Some of it flew around in the second hurricane. So it's – St. Petersburg is – Quite a mess. Thankfully, we have a good governor, but we have an awful mayor, and uh, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Local matters too, no question. Well, it's the the yes. FEMA thing. The FEMA thing is so you know I I experienced this through and Ian in particular uh, when I got hit, and so the FEMA thing. Yeah, they're 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 like the insurance companies, which are like the government. I mean, they're the big, big they essentially are utilities. Um, and so. Th- so FEMA is Johnny on the spot with that seven hundred fifty dollars that direct deposits to your account, and then poof, yep. they're gone. Uh, the insurance companies right. Johnny on the spot for pennies on the dollar of whatever uh, you assess initially, and then poof, they're gone, and you have to you know litigate the matter for years into the future. The the big long term issue for us here, and also in other uh, disaster prone states, is what's going to happen to our homeowners. Policies because during the Biden administration, I don't have the figure right in front of me, but I looked it up a few days ago. Those insurance rates, especially for homeowners, have gone up something like 200% here in Florida. 
Um, the government has done nothing about that. And imagine what's going to happen now after two hurricanes to our homeowners. Uh, how are people going to afford it? How am I going to afford it? I don't know. Many people also lost their cars, too. Cars were completely flooded. Some friends of ours lost both of their vehicles. Actually, the, so, interesting, I mean, it's, yeah, the interesting thing is, sorry, is the insurance companies have, have actually, my understanding, and from just anecdotal, but – um, but mm-hmm. I think that the numbers back this up. The insurance company is actually pretty good with cars and boats and terrible with houses. It's just interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I don't know why that is, but mm-hmm. it is. Um, uh, yeah, I did. All right, so I want to get to to you on Kamala, yeah. the candidate, not yeah. just Kamala, the uh, emergency responder. <laughs> um, so so your your takeaway from her interview with Brett Baer and, and where you feel the race is. Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, I put the over under at her mentioning the words opportunity economy at three and i think she actually only mentioned it once if i if i'm not mistaken so i I think it's a failure on that end right you've got to get that phrase opportunity economy in there at least half a dozen times in a Kamala speech right she also only got the transnational gangs thing in there once she usually at least mentions that two or three times so I, she struggled to get her talking points in, didn't she? I mean, Brett was very good at interrupting her. He had basically zero tolerance for her filibustering or refusing to answer the question. It was enjoyable. It was very enjoyable to watch, I have to say. Thrilling. Yeah, I, yeah no, I mean, that's it's the first time that she has really been pressed in a, in a yeah. professional way, but really pressed by someone. Yeah, it was wonderful. And I, why did she do that? I'm absolutely – I remain – shocked that she decided to appear on Fox News. Well, you know, maybe she has a delusional view of her abilities. I mean, that's always a possibility yeah. with with politicians, isn't it? I, I think so. What I look at is the um, the betting markets, you know, before and after big events like that. So I looked at poly market, which is one of the biggest gambling markets in the race. Uh, I believe it like a day before the uh the interview on fox and i believe it was trump was at 58 percent when i looked this morning trump was a hair short of 61 percent so a lot of gamblers looked at that and 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 put more money on trump yeah kind of a a couple of bad days not showing up for the al smith dinner too is not going to do her any good yeah but i think you know all of this I, the only danger is things are looking really good. Things are looking much more optimistic since the last time I spoke to you guys. At that time, I was terrified of a Kamala victory. Now I, I remain nervous, though, and I'll tell you for one major reason, what? and that is the lack of you know the, the red wave that did not materialize in 2022 concerns me. And I'm wondering still, why did that not happen other than here in Florida? And we were we were anticipating this big victory. Uh, we deserved a huge victory, and we did not get one. Because and, um, because that Trump still concerns be, me. Well, because Trump wasn't on the ballot. That's why. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I know everybody says abortion, but it's because Trump wasn't on the ballot, and so the the base vote that you're going to have turn out in a presidential, mm-hmm. particularly with Trump on the ballot, just didn't come out because you know a lot of that Trump vote is not particularly enamored with the Republican Party and the Republican Party's mm-hmm. leadership in the House and Senate. So they're not going to die in a hill for the Republicans on the Hill, but they are for Trump. And that's the big difference. I think you may be right. Our people have to turn out. You know, it's really it's it's really it's it's close. I still think that it's close. Um, it's about turnout. She has a lot more money, apparently a better ground game, technically, is from what I've read and heard mm. so I, you know there's there's a lot of reasons for optimism but i think some people are getting a little too optimistic and cocky about it like it's a slam dunk i don't think it's a slam dunk yet to be honest with you it's moving in the right direction but i remain i guess concerned you know what i mean like right now i'm thinking 70 30 but i don't know how do you feel yeah i'm i'm uh, i would call myself guardedly optimistic um but mm-hmm. my Amy? my comp my confidence is growing i'm worried okay Ever yeah. since Kamala got on the ticket, I'll, I'll never forget the when I heard Joe Biden dropped out of the race or was forced out. My heart sank, and I thought, "Oh dear God!" But right, I am. You know, Dan, I listened to you because I'll never forget in 2016. You told me Trump's going to win. I said, "There's no way," and you were right. And then in 2020, I, you know, you you would not, you weren't predicting. You you said you you weren't sure. You didn't know. And now this time around, you're saying that he's going to. Well, I'm from the Bill Buckley school of making political predictions, which is I only predict the things I want to see happen. Okay. (laughs) so if I'm not making a prediction, that means I think something that I don't want to see is going to happen. You know what else concerns me is that is the is the demographic issue. We're really relying upon the male vote. 
And mm. men are not, not quite as diligent in turning out. You know, people have sent me uh, data. I don't have it right in front of me about propensity of voting. And women are a little bit more diligent about voting than men. And there's more women than there are men in the country. And there's a few swing states, too, where it might be 53, 54 percent of registered voters are men, I believe I have read. I'm sorry, are women. So that concerns me a little bit, too. Like, he, he can't lose by, like, 10 or 15 points amongst women. He's got to keep that single digit, I think. If he loses the female vote by 8%, 9%, he's going to win. If he loses it by, like, 12%, 13%, and women are turning out more than we are, then that's where it gets sketchy. Dave Seminar, a former diplomat, author of Footsteps of Federer, as well as Mad Travelers, A Tale of Wonderlust, Greed, and the Quest to Reach the Ends of the Earth. Dave, thanks for joining us. Glad you survived the Thank hurricanes. You guys. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Take care. You Bye-bye. too. Thank and you. he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. The stories you need to know to start your day. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. Signature Bank is Chicago's fastest growing independently owned business bank. It's a bank where relationships still matter. Signature Bank knows your name and your story. I'm Dan Proft, and I know this because Signature Bank is my business bank. Hi, I'm Paul Jenkins, owner of Bancroft Architects and Engineers, a service-disabled veteran-owned small business providing